Good afternoon. We are here to talk about the real pressure on creators, technology creators, as well as corporate leaders to balance that pressure for innovation and weaving technology into their products and services against the extra costs, the extra efforts that it takes to accomplish that. And so our thesis here is that this ethical technology approach, responsible technology, is actually good for business and uh, is really the optimal solution because tech in the wild has real legal and reputational risks. So thanks for being here, both of you, Rebecca and Lambert. I'm going to start with you, Rebecca, and I want to talk about the breadth of your career that you spent at ThoughtWorks and still now helping companies find technology solutions, implement them, test them. And I want to start just by reflecting on how consequential these legal and reputational risks can be. We have LLMs that are training on copyrighted material. We have deep fakes stealing audio and visual identities. We have self-driving cars, GM's crews getting into trouble, Alphabet's Waymo. We have test automated driving software in litigation. So that's just the start. So I want you to elaborate to just lay the landscape of what kind of risks we're seeing. Well, it varies a lot based on the kind of industry that, that, that you're in. Uh, one of the reasons this is so important now is that it isn't just Amazon getting a recommendation wrong. It's AI systems that are advising judges on sentence recommendations. And that can have a critical impact on somebody's life. They're helping with medical diagnoses. Um, when, when you also look at compliance, uh, there, there are increasing regulations around data privacy and things of that nature. And some of the fines that, are, um, that, that can be levied under GDPR can cripple organizations, um, particularly those that run on very low margins because they look at a percentage of revenue and your fine is, is associated with, with your revenue. And there are some industries where you know, that level of fine you know, can put somebody out of business. And Lambert, you at your work at the UN, you have taken a broad look at how these technologies can be consequential even to whole societies. Can you elaborate a little bit on some of the problems you're seeing that are even more broad than just at the corporate level? Sure, yeah. So at the UN, we often work with the most vulnerable people in the world, the most vulnerable populations. And there is enormous risk when you look at th this point. Um, here, here in America, we might hear about self-driving cars and uh, online shopping experiences and these kind of things. But in other parts of the world, there's whole different kinds of issues. At the individual level, we, we deal with uh, refugees. People are fleeing persecution, ethnic or political, religious persecution. And the data privacy of their personal data is literally often a question of life and death. And then you have groups, um, groups of women, for instance, or groups of uh, particular indigenous groups or children as a, as a group. And you know, there, when you talk about data analytics and the kind of analysis that you can do with AI, um, it's often very specific to those kind of, of groups. And sometimes they are excluded from the kind of uh, the, the logic that is built into the models, right? And then you have whole societies. Um, there is a lot of countries where these big tech companies are con concentrated, and a lot of co companies that do not have these companies and don't have the, the laws like GDPR, etc. And their data is just being sucked up, etc. So enormous risk from that respect. So if we go back 20, 30 years and we look at the last big wave of technology, social media, mm. well, those innovators, they were told to move fast and break things. And yes, there were consequences. We saw Facebook suffer tremendous fines, $5 billion plus for uh, their what are called, I suppose, nefarious acts. I'll, I'll leave it at that. But they weren't necessarily wrong, perhaps, from a financial perspective to take that approach. So why should today's innovators do something different? 
Rebecca? Again, it's, it's, to, to me, it's the, the kinds of consequences. Um, nobody, nobody died because of Cambridge Analytics. Um, people are dying in some of these autonomous vehicles when they get something wrong and they drive into a wall because they didn't actually recognize it was a wall. Uh, and so the, the, the consequences are, are so different. And, and I think there's also more of an appreciation um, as AI has become so much into the public consciousness. Um, move fast and break things with respect to AI is a lot scarier to people mm. uh, because you hear some pretty prominent voices saying, whoa, Nelly, you know, let's take a six months pause on development. Um, when, when you've got those kinds of things going on, an attitude that is, oh, well, we'll fix it if it breaks, uh, doesn't, ha doesn't fly with respect to your brand reputation the way it does before. And the other thing is, it's one thing, I mean, Facebook and Twitter and all of that, you know, they're, they're seen as these innovators and these crazy people. What would, you know, an international bank, are they going to go fast and break things? They, they, they simply cannot afford it. And so I do think the rules, the rules have changed, but people's tolerance is much lower than it was before. Lambert? Yeah, I think there's these interesting two dynamics happening at the same time. On the one hand, technology allows us to do much more analytics and personalized uh, experiences to people. And um, at the same time, there is this, this movement in society that people are much more concerned about their personal data and about what is happening to them with, with AI, what companies are doing with AI. And um, I, I published a book last year on data privacy, but I think that the same is true for AI as well, um, where I said that data privacy used to be a compliance issue. It sat with the legal department in companies. And I was arguing in that book to move it to the boardroom and make it a strategic issue and, and make data privacy, and I would say AI as well, a strategic differentiator because if you can present yourself as a company that can be trusted with your data, that can be trusted in how they use AI, that can be a huge strategic advantage. Now, there are smaller companies that are looking for ways to accomplish risk management here without spending too much money. They're gonna be worried that this is a tremendous cost for them, but maybe not so. Uh, you both collaborated on a project to try to give some tools to those who don't have uh, panels of lawyers looking out for them. So can you talk a little bit about that? How can an innovator tackle this problem without a lot of dollars thrown at it? Well, what, what we did uh, was we created something called the Responsible Tech Playbook, and we collected uh, facilitation techniques that were not just created by, by us, but created by others and worked out all of the licensing so we, we could put that, that material out there. And they're very simple techniques to get us out of our own head. As, as, as technologists and problem solvers, we, we see a problem and there's the problem and this is the audience I'm solving it for. And these techniques, and, and some of them are very simple. There's something called the tarot cards of tech. And one of them is, you know, the bad actor. How many of you, when you've created a product, thought about how can somebody use my product to do bad things? We just don't think about it. We're focused on solving the problem. We're f we assume people are going to be nice and use the product the way we want them to use it. But just the simple act of thinking, how might somebody use this for harm, can get us to look at our products in a different way and maybe put in the kinds of guardrails that may have prevented some of those social media d disasters that, that, that happened. So it doesn't have to be expensive. You know, some of these workshops take two hours with you know, a group of a half a dozen people. Well, that's not a whole lot of cost to, uh, to address what could be a potentially massive reputation hit in the market. Lambert, did you walk away thinking this could be done without throwing a lot of money at it? Well, we, we didn't have a lot of money to, uh, <laughs> to, to spend on it, but we did know it was important. And I think 
what is important to us is, is first of all, it's, it's not a tool that some experts have to come and apply to these projects. It's, it's things that teams themselves can do, non-technical people can, can take this up and uh, go through these, these exercises. It's, it's gamified almost, and um, uh, that's very important. And I think over time, what we hope that it will do is to create a mindset where when people start a technology project, they immediately think about not only the intended consequences, but also the potential for unintended consequences. And if we achieve that mindset, then I think we have achieved a lot. So it's a consciousness. Yep. Yes. OK. Now, what about detection tools? There are creators out there that are going to want to go out in the market and say, well, I'm just going to slap this detection tool on my product, on my service. Where are we? Where is the technology there? It's a whole lot harder than you think. There, um, I was actually having the, this this discussion yesterday at the uh, uh, at the previous day of, of, of CIS. Um, there are some things that it's relatively easy to d detect. Um, if if you're scanning for personal identifiable information that might be being sent out somewhere. There are a fair number of detectors that do a pretty good job of picking that out. Uh, but if you start to extend it uh, into more complex areas where it might not be this individual thing that makes it PII, but this combined with this thing over here that nobody's looking at at the moment can give you information. Uh, and so it becomes very difficult to completely detect things. Uh, there's some, actually some interesting work uh, that, that has been going on on artificial immune systems where these detectors basically try to do what your body does and detect normal. And then as it, when it sees something that's not normal, it doesn't have to know specifically what's wrong. It's just, it's different. This doesn't belong here and therefore, um, and, and so it's, a, it's a, an extension of, of anomaly detection, but it allows them to start to say, hey, one of these is not like the other, and so somebody who can actually look at this thing, uh, go, go take a look at it. Uh, but yeah, de de detection within narrow areas, that's not that difficult of a problem, but the kind of general detection we're talking about, that's, we're, we're a ways away from that. So a human still needs to be very much in the loop? Oh, yes. Humans need to be in the loop right now on a lot of what we're doing with, with AI simply because it doesn't actually know anything. <laughs> <laughs> and so it saw nothing wrong with a black Viking when it was asked to produce <laughs> the picture of a Viking. It saw nothing wrong with that. Um, and so there's so much context that still isn't there, even though it feels like it's there because they respond in such a human-like way. But it's not. <laughs> That's not a person back there. <laughs> now, Lambert, what about the idea that some may have to say, OK, I'm going to go into the move fast and break things category, and it's not really my problem as a creator, as a company, Anyway, in the case of social media, we could say, well, that's the parent's job to be the police. What do you find in your work is a reasonable answer to that mindset? Well, I think it's, I'm, I'm not sure that I have the definitive answer, but I think it's very important that we ask ourselves this question, that who is supposed to make responsible tech happen? Is it the government? Should there be regulation that says all tech should be responsible? Is it companies? And, and as we discussed before, it's very much in the company's interest to act responsibly. Um, is it the developers? Should we require every developer of technology to do a course or whatever to get that mindset of responsible tech? Or is it with the users? Should we make sure that the new generation of young people get much more savvy about how they use technology. And I think it's probably a little bit of, of everything. So I'd like to finish off and just have you 
brainstorm a few more of these areas that have been problematic. When we were talking backstage, Rebecca, you mentioned some university students who were not given their graduation certificate because of detection yes. software with large language models. Is yes. that right? There, there, was a, there was a university that um, brought in um, one of these detectors um, to detect whether or not final essays had been created by uh, large language models or not. And there were lots of students that were denied graduation, and they were actually able to prove that, no, they did, in fact, write those things. Um, and so they ultimately were, were given their, their di diplomas. Um, and and th this is where the problem comes in, because to some extent, it's, again, not that hard for a human to look at something and say, you know, that language is, is strange um, for this student who I know. Um, and therefore, that probably came from somewhere else. It's different for an algorithm to say, you know, this, this, is, this clearly comes from it. And so, uh, uh, again, um, there, there are failures like this everywhere. And the thing that people don't, don't necessarily think about, uh, people uh, equate hallucinations with mistakes. It's not a mistake. Generative AI is supposed to make things up. That's its purpose. How would it create a short story in the tone of William Faulkner if it didn't know how to make something up? And it wants to be helpful. So if it doesn't have case law that a lawyer has asked for, it will make up a case. And it behooves the human to do a quick Google search and make sure that case exists before they turn it into the judge or they'll get fined <laughs> like has happened multiple times. Solid advice. <laughs> and Lambert, you brought up VR glasses and the ability to read emotions by biological changes in a, a user's eyes. Um, can you talk a little bit about that or other things that you've seen that you see as risks that people could be getting their mindset around? Yeah, I, I think what's important is to realize that it's not a finite set of risks that we're talking about and if we fix those, we're, we're done. Because technology keeps evolving and with it, new risks come. And VR is a good, good example because um, Putting people into one of these virtual worlds is, is a very immersive environment and it exacerbates, that experience exacerbates all kinds of previous risks. Um, in the UN, for example, we have an office that looks at preventing violence against children. And they came to me asking, what about this metaverse thing? Um, you know, what, what is the potential there for children? to be exposed even more to things like bullying, traumatic experiences, et cetera. And those are very good questions to ask. And I don't think we have thought through all of that. And it will keep happening with all the new technologies that we invent. Well, we know the Surgeon General in the US had something to say about that this past mm -hmm. week. So mm -hmm. thank you both. Thanks for your insight, Rebecca Lambert. Really appreciate it. Thank you.